Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome back to Mythgard in Middle-Earth. My name is Corey Olson, the Tolkien Professor, and I am joined, as always, by my friend Grifflet, who is here warming himself by the campfire uh, of the Avonk Luth here in the Dunbog because it's it's clammy and and wet and kind of chilly here in the Dunbog, so he's kind of sticking close to the fire, warming and drying off his boots after his explorations of last week. Uh, so, uh, and again, no, uh, no blame to him for that. Uh, good to see you guys all back with me again here. Uh, sorry for that. Uh, so, okay. I, I always apologize for being late because I'm pretty much always late. Um, I was going to be a couple minutes late because I, uh, you know, I finished, uh, the Silmarillion film project, uh, right before it's time to start as I usually do. Um, but then of course I discovered that they had done another update. I did the one earlier in the week, of course, but I missed the, like the second update, like the hot fix or whatever it was this week. So, um, I found myself updating here over the last few minutes. So sorry about that. Um, but all right, so let's, uh, Grifflet up and at him here. Let's, um, uh, let's get moving. And, uh, oh, we got to turn in the quests because we did all of our, our various hunting and gathering quests here, uh, but we didn't uh, we didn't turn them in. So let's 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 turn them in here. The Oakwe Rod requires us to give welcome to Devoni. Okay, are these are you the frog dude? I have saved you a tremendous amount of time and effort doing work that you detest. Hey, that's my job. You know, if I can do some like thankless, annoying work that people don't then and prevent other people having to do it, that's real heroism right there. Okay, uh, your wife will be happy when you return sooner than you otherwise would. Okay, that's good. I'm glad to hear that she'll be happy about that. I'm not glad you're gone. So, very good. Um, I'm not completely useless like the others you have seen come through here. Okay, that's a positive attitude. I like that. Um, oh, but you know what that makes me think, right? I want I want a title. Can't we get that title? Not completely useless, right? Wouldn't that be an awesome title? That title doesn't exist, does it? Does that title exist? If that title doesn't exist, it needs to exist, right? Why can't I get a title that says, uh, that says not completely useless? Oh, man. Okay. Now I really want that. All right. Anyway. Okay. Uh, right. Alon. 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 The turf moods have been destroyed. Okay. I pray to I, the Uch we rod that we right. Free. Hush. Uh, I've done all that we... Yeah, I, I did everything. It was awesome. I dealt with nice rudeness and without complaint. Yeah, no, exactly. I'm very long-suffering. Um, uh, perhaps I can do some good, unlike the other devotiad that have passed through here. Okay. Right. How many have you seen? How many have there been? Have you seen the... Who are you talking about? There'll be few who'll venture out of doors with you around. Wait, what? <laughs> Hang on. There'll be f few devotiad? Few of the avant Luth? Nobody will go out of doors while I'm here because they're avoiding me? Because they're afraid of me? I don't understand. Speak with Bane. Bane? 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 And perhaps he can help you gain some trust among the people of the Avanc. All right, I'll go to Hlan Ross. Okay. Um, yeah. So I'm not wrong, right? Not completely useless would be a really excellent quest. Or title, rather. That would be an awesome title. Um... Oh, <laughs> JJ, okay. I just saw your question, JJ. Um, so, J... Hang on, I've got a question first. You hear that? That rushing, roaring sound? Is that generated by frogs? So that's the bog toad hissing? That's the sound that frogs make. It sounds like airplanes passing overhead. Uh, 
Yeah? Wow. Okay. Sorry, I was just confused um, by the hissing frogs. You can have hissing frogs. Why can't you have hissing frogs? Um, okay. Hey, all right. And then where's the town? There's the town. All right. Um, okay. Um. <laughs> okay, so ALJ Bookworm says, how does Griffoot feel about Yule Fest and most importantly about elk mounts? Well, the Yule Fest is the only festival I've been to more than once. Um, uh, so I have some experience with the Yule Fest. The Yule Fest is kind of, I'm not a festival guy in general, uh, but I like the Yule Festival uh, and have been back to it, as I say, more than once. I mean, it's as it's the one with the it's the one with the play, right? Which is awesome. That's why I've been back more than once. Um, so, um, uh, and <laughs> how do I feel about elk mounts? I'm entirely in favor of elk mounts. Uh, that you are welcome here, as long as you do not trouble us. Who could object to elk mounts? Um. Uh, but anyway, okay. So here we are in Hlanros. <laughs> I like the little bus shelter this guy has. That's so cool. It's like an outhouse, and it's like a, a little school bus shelter. That is so thoughtful. I mean, it's entirely impractical, right? I mean, 100% impractical. Because, I mean, look at this. Look at this. If you're sitting in here, right? Here, Griffith, get in the shack. Oh, you can't get in the shed? Oh, if you're in the shed, like even here just next to the shed, right? What can I see from inside? If I'm sitting on my little my little thinking spot, right, inside the little shed here, I can see this way. So, get out the way, man. Okay, I can see I can see towards the town and I can see this way, but I can't see anything else. Presumably, you got to think that a sentry here, right? His job has got to be what? watching out to make sure that wow look even from here you can see it no that's the one in the middle right it's the one am i pointing towards the where where am i i'm behind the thing hang on yeah okay yeah yeah it's uh it's this what's this called again flam cadlos yeah that i'm seeing from in the distance anyway okay sorry um anytime i see like a gondorian ruin up above the tree line in the distance i gotta i gotta reorient myself um so but you're are they watching just from this direction and from the town? Because, I mean, like, you couldn't see anything from this direction. You couldn't even see the horses, right? People could be stealing the horses right next to you. And, you, I mean, why enclose your lookout in a space that prevents him seeing almost anything, right? Um, uh, yeah. Um... Yeah. Anyway, sorry. I got completely distracted by the adorable and impractical little uh, little sentry shed uh, that they built for him here, which is especially strange because it's a better constructed shed than any of the other wooden structures around here. Um, but I was talking about something, and JJ, I have a vague... Oh, your Sam question. Yeah, I'll come back to your Sam. Well, let me look at the town, JJ, and then I'll come back to your Sam question. Um, hang on, let me make sure I remember your Sam question. What's your Sam question? Uh, oh yeah, okay. Is there any significance to Sam waving his hands south rather than west when in Shelob's tunnel and wondering how everyone else is doing? Yeah, so you may remember... Thank you, background music. You may remember that um, while he's in Shelob's tunnel and he's wondering where everybody else is away over there and he waves his hand in what he thinks is a westerly direction towards Minas Tirith, but is actually towards the south. The narrator tells us that he's all turned around and he has no idea where he's going, and so he's waving it towards the south. Uh, is there any significance to that? Um, okay, I think that maybe we can uh, uh, answer that quickly. No. <laughs> I, don't, I, mean, I don't think it's, uh, you know, uh, there's like a great symbolic significance there um, that he's pointing towards the south, mostly because the, the south does not have the kind of, um, you know, 
thematic resonance, you know, that like East and West have in the Lord of the Rings. Um, so why is that there at all? To remind us of how disoriented Sam is at that moment, right? Um, how he's concerned about his friend's just to emphasize the distance between them, like not just geographic, like he doesn't even know in what direction his friends lie, right? So emphasizing how to, the extent to which Sam is cut off from everybody else, right? Um, it, that's one of the effects, I would say, there. Um, uh, yeah, I guess, I guess those are the two things that I would go with. Um, and yeah, I mean, it is just a bit of humor, JJ, but see, that's never, because it's funny, is never a, a completely satisfying reason to, uh, to explain why a reference is there, right? Um, because there's always the question, like, why that joke instead of something else, right? Um... A, why is he making a joke there at all? And B, what is the, like, point of the joke? Because jokes have points, right? I mean, like, it's, it, it, you know, and, and he may, he's making a choice of making one kind of joke against instead of another kind of joke. Um, so just saying that it's a joke is not, is not again, it doesn't fully explain uh, the situation. There's always, more, there's always more to be thinking about, even with things that are, that are sort of put in for humor. Um, it's exactly as unsatis. I mean, it's exactly as unsatisfying as saying, um, you know, if you're asking questions like, um, you know, why, uh, what is the significance of, you know, like Theoden's death, you know, in battle, you know, and and if the answer to that is because he wanted something very serious and kind of sad to happen, that's obviously not a very satisfying explanation, right? I mean, there's. Like, yeah, okay, but there's lots of serious things that could have happened, right? Why that one? Um, it, to say that is to say nothing about Theoden's story, right? And how this fits into Theoden's story and how Theoden's story uh, interacts with the other stories that are going on, right? I mean, it's when you put it in that kind of a context, it's an obviously inadequate explanation. And yet a lot of people will kind of sometimes act like if something is funny, saying, well, he put that in because it's funny is a sufficient explanation. It's not. Like, again, that kind of explanation is, uh, is never, uh, t to me, sort of sufficient. Um, okay. Uh, oh, Finn Boga has a good question. I, I, let, me, let me carry on. I gotta, I gotta, I'm never going to make it anywhere in the town here if I don't. Let me, I want to explore the town and then I'll come back, Finn Boga, to your lore question. Uh, let's see if I can remember that. Okay. All right. Yep. So, Alan, you disagree with Alan having sent me in, huh? Strangers dance their way through our lands with no regard to the plights of my people. Okay. Everyone is referring to lots of outlanders coming through. Why? Who? When? What's going on here? Help your village. Yeah, I'm here to help. I help all people all the time. I'm in particular interested in some gigantic creature carrying kids in a bag. If you've happened to have seen that, there's a kid I would like to rescue. But, uh, Okay. Um, oh wait, I've got to I've got to pick a. Hmm. Let's see. Oh, okay. It's another helmet that looks the same as my current helmet. I guess. Fine. Uh, or my current cosmetic helmet, anyway. Oh, it's might based though. Let's see. Ooh, that's an upgrade. Yeah. Oh, let's get the sword. Absolutely. Hear me out. My secondary weapon. I have a tale to tell. Okay. You need to eat. Well, you think the things that the Dunbog offers are some of the best provender ever eaten, huh? <laughs> I've become hungry just thinking about our delicacies. Uh, okay. Slug meat. Yes. Tender baby slug meat. All right, maybe that's really good. Okay. Baby slugs are protected by the adults. 
Do not want to be attacked by a group of angry slug matrons. You're having me on. Come on now. You're just having me on now, aren't you? Fine. Slug matrons. Not speak the names of evil Okay. Uh, collect... Hey, oh, look, this guy is happy, right? Uh, he's, uh, he loves meeting new people. Ah, very good. Excellent. And he's saying you don't meet many very often, so I guess you haven't seen the hordes of Devodia that have been coming through your lands, apparently. Uh, you are a village of huts, lots and lots of huts. But they don't stand up to being, well, to being half-submerged in swamp water all day in constant need of repair. Okay, so you need mud with which to... So I need to find some mud. Somehow search through the swamp to find mud. Okay. Wait, the beetles gather up the mud and roll it into neat little balls. You're not sure why, but we use them to patch our huts. Now, yeah, what's the worst that could happen? All right. Mud balls. Beetle rolled mud balls. I can do this. Uh... So this is like Lake Town, except it's Swamp Town, all right? It's a town that's built on pilings that are that are set into the ground. It's meant to be just above the surface of the water, I guess. <laughs> oh, this guy's just looking at the wares. Okay, I got it. Yeah, what are you selling here? Oh, bows, huh? That's a, that's a that's kind of a nice crossbow there. Yeah, I like the inlay work here, particularly. I don't know about the spiky business up here. Looks a little... I don't know. I guess it looks a little manta ray, right? That's kind of cool. But, oh, hang on, sorry, man. I gotta, I gotta, I gotta do... Where's my sword? Where's my new sword? There's my new sword. And I equip that as my new secondary sword. Okay. Better. All right. Okay. Sorry, don't want to get in your way. You're looking at things. What does the provisioner have? Uh, like, you're selling backpacks? That's cool. And parcels? Yeah, just... Parcels tied up with string? Are they mystery parcels? I like this backpack with the extra pockets around the side and everything. It's, and then these attractive messenger bags. Wow, oh, that's great. And I'm going to do my milestone here. Yeah, I'll do my milestone. Okay. Let's see. Uh, anybody else with quests for me to go out and do? Just the two of you? Mud and slugs, that's all I get? Got the elders here, but apparently I haven't done enough to catch their attention. So just mud and slugs. You know, these huts are huge. I mean, like, look at how much bigger these are than, you know, say, the buildings in Chlanuk. Oh, this is where the fun-loving folks are. Okay. <laughs> Those guys over there all look really serious. And around the corner, their women folk are dancing on tables. All right. I like this place already. This is much better. And what's it? What are you doing to that? Are you milking the cow? Um, okay, you're doing it wrong. That's not the way it's supposed to go. She really needs to... I... Never mind. I... I... Ah... Uh, I can't even... Maybe he's petting. Maybe he's, maybe the cow 
is getting a tummy rub. Maybe that's what's happening here. So he was petting the cow, and the cow did like my little dog does and, like, rolled over on her back in order to have her tummy scratched. Right? And that's what he's doing because you can't possibly milk a cow while she's lying on the ground like that, not to mention the fact that he's got no bucket anyway. You know what, man? I just leave you to it, whatever it is. What's this guy doing? Uh, are you... Cleaning? Are you picking things off of the planks and chucking them in the water? That seems inefficient. Like maybe a, a broom? Man, these guys are occupied in some weird tasks. <laughs> JJ is urging me not to assume that my Shire methods are superior to their Dunboggian techniques. You know, I, I'm, I'm willing to be open-minded, but... Uh, ah! Lobster traps? Do you catch slugs in these? Are they slug traps? Oh, see, there's the door. Slugs go in. What's to stop anything coming out of it? They look like lobster traps, but that's not, you, you know, that's not how a lobster trap works, you know. You need things to keep them just walking right back out again. I mean... They're dumb, but they're not that dumb. I mean, maybe slugs are that dumb. Maybe they're for slugs. What are these nets about? Why do we have nets here? Just like a guardrail? Keep your children from falling in? I mean, it looks kind of like the netting around a trampoline, right? Uh, is that the point? Is it just net making? Right? Are we making nets? Are these are drying, you think? Okay. Okay. Well, I mean, I wouldn't be surprised that they have nets. That seems... Oh, and there's that guy having a moment with his cow. Uh, concerning which I've decided I want no further information. Um, but anyway, I was just saying before I was surprised by the several activities. These... Um, these, these huts are, are much larger than I, I would have expected small huts you know on account of the lack of firm ground and then we've got this two story one two story hut with an inaccessible door up at the top huh yeah alright they could be mending the nets Phil I agree Oh, this one has a stone foundation. Well, because, yeah, it's on this, uh, it's on a fairly big piece of mainland. Oh, and we're doing archery practice. That's good. That's practical. Excellent. Yeah. You never know when those frogs are going to attack. They are pretty noisy. Oh, here we are. Training for battle. Okay. And we got, oh, it's a wagon. Okay. All right. Oh, and here's somebody else picking things off of the wood. Okay. Alright. That's good. Um, and no one else seems to have a quest for me, so I'll just do slugs and mud balls. I guess. Um, hey, look, a baby bog slug. Um, meanwhile, while I uh, find some more slugs here, um, let me uh, go back to my question. So the lore question, Finboga's question, right. What happened to the bodies of the Nazgul and the Oathbreakers? Did they experience the same wraithification process? That is the same as each other, and presumably also same as, as uh, you know, Frodo was threatening to undergo. And Okay, all right. Um... No. Did they 
experience the same wraithification process. I'm going with no here. Um, I th where are the bodies of the oath breakers? That's I think fairly simple. Um, decaying in their tombs would be where they are, right? That it's it's the spirits, not the bodies, of the oath breakers that are bound. So. Um, he, uh, when the Oathbreakers die, oh man, is it Beetle gonna burst out of this thing when I pick it up? No, I'm gonna call it 12 mud balls. Oh, whoa, lots of crook, lots of avonk here. Hang on a second. Are these, oh wait, they're dead. Wow. Hey there, Gwen. Many foul things dwell in the you were just resting a moment after fighting these Avonk. Yeah, wow. The trick to fighting Avonk is to turn your ordinary fighting skills into extraordinary fighting skills. All right, good advice. Okay. Um, you're going to take a short nap. Tell it though I, I'm well, but I need a new sword. Okay. All right, uh, I'll go back and I'll, I'll get some more mud balls first. Um, okay, so, yeah, so the Oathbreakers are not wraiths, uh, certainly not in the same sense uh, as the Ringwraiths are wraiths. So we have the... Um, uh, the Ringwraiths, who were mortal men, whose um, whose spirits get uh, okay. When you put on the ring, you are invisible because you sort of pass from the normal world into the wraith world. Those remember these these two worlds in which uh, elf lords like Glorfindel, um, they live in both of them at the same time, right? Um, whereas normal people don't; they're just in the one and not in the other. Uh, and so, you become eventually the wraithification process. When Gandalf describes the wraithification process, he talks about it as becoming invisible permanently, right? That you become trapped in that wraith world. And so you're invisible because you no longer have that same connection um, to the regular world. So what happens to your body is a really good question. But hang on, so I'll come back to that question. Um, but again, the point is the, um, the oath breakers, not the same. They die eventually. So they break their oath and the curse is laid upon them and they die. Um, and when they die, their spirits don't go away. So that's the problem there. Um, so you've got a body and a spirit. Everybody's got a body and a spirit. Well, at least all the incarnate races have a body and a spirit. And uh, so like when an elf's body dies, their spirit goes to Valinor, you know, goes to the halls of Mandos. And then after a while, it can generate a new body. It can, it, it can make up a new body based on the old one um, after it's released, after the spirit is released from the halls of Mandos. Humans, however, men, um, go, their spirits depart. So death is the sundering of, my, of spirit and body. Um, they go from, uh, so their bodies remain and decay, right? They leave their bodies behind and their spirits go elsewhere. The effect of the curse on the Oathbreakers seems to have been essentially preventing their spirits from going elsewhere. So instead of going on to their destined rest, whatever that may be, by the, uh, the curse of Isildur, the spirits of the, uh, uh, of the Oathbreakers are constrained to remain here in Middle-earth, and then they are released. When, so when Aragorn releases them, they don't just... Like, you know, just, they don't just become invisible or something like that, right? The spirits actually depart entirely uh, from the... Ooh, I finished all the slugs, too. Fantastic. I didn't even see a single slug matron. That's great. Um, 
Okay, oh, right, there's the town. Uh, so yeah, so basically, so the Oathbreakers are just spirits without bodies, separated from their, they're dead, so their spirits are separated from their bodies, their bodies are lying moldering in the tombs, but the spirits are still hanging out and looking for, uh, you know, uh, waiting for, like, some way to escape and get out where they're supposed to go, which they can't do until they're released uh, by the heir of Isildur, in this case. Um, and uh, and so then they finally go. But again, the wraiths are in a different situation. So now back to the question, where do the wraiths go? Where do the wraiths' bodies go? Um, because they don't die. Death being, again, by definition, the sundering of spirit and body, right? When those two things are, are, are separated from each other, then that's what death is. Um, that doesn't happen with the wraiths. They just continue. They become, in the end, invisible permanently. Again, quoting Gandalf here in his explanation to, to Frodo. Um... But it's really tricky because um, it's really tricky because their bodies don't exactly leave our world. You can tell because you can still interact physically with them. You can't see them, right? When Bilbo's wearing the ring, you can't see Bilbo, but he still interacts with the physical world around him, right? I mean... Gollum failed to grab him when he jumped over his head, but if he hadn't missed, he would have grabbed him, invisible or not, right? Um, uh, a magic ring is no protection from wolves on your trail, right? Because they will sm smell you out, and they'll catch you and eat you even though you're invisible. Um, and yes, Phil, if you're invisible and the buttons get ripped off your coat, they become visible when they're lying on the ground and your coat is actually ripped. So, um, we... Your body is there. It's just not seen. So, becoming invisible permanently, therefore, logically, would not mean having no body. And obviously, the ring wraiths have bodies. Um, the witch king has a knee, for instance, right? A knee behind which Mary can stab, into which Mary can stab from behind. Yeah, ex uh, um, JJ, you're right. Even the mentioning of sinews in his mighty knee. His knee might be invisible, but it is still mighty. It has mighty sinews. Uh, uh, and Phil, yeah, I agree with you. I, uh, the mighty knee of the of the witch king. I I have been delighted by the adjective mighty applied to the noun knee ever since I was young reading the book. Um, so uh, yeah. Anyway, okay. So clearly, not only does the witch king have a knee, but his knees are mighty. And they have uh, they have similar kind of biology. I mean, so like the implication is that uh, if you were to instead of stabbing the witch king in the back of the knee, you were to strike the side of the witch king's knee. The witch king could like tear his MCL and ACL. They would be invisible. They would be a, an invisible ACL and MCL, but they would tear. Right? Those are presumably the the sinews in question in his mighty knee. Uh, so right, exactly, they're tangible but not visible. In other words, like Bilbo and his buttons and everything else, right? Their their bodies seem to be there. They're just they look ghostly, and this, of course, explains why Frodo can see them when he has the ring on, right? Um, because then he's in the wraith world like them, and he can see them. And when he sees them, he doesn't see, you know, ghostly shapes. Um, he calls him the Pale King. He looks pale, which is, of course, I suppose, understandable. Um, but um, uh, but they they're not they don't look like ghosts. Um, so I think then the answer to where is your body when you become a wraith is 
where it always was. It's still there. You're, as a race, as a wraith, you're by definition. So the raids are not undead, right? They are not those who are dead who have been raised to life. They are the living that have been dragged out. Their life has been artificially stretched out until it is until every moment is a weariness to them, right? They are not dead and reanimated. Um, they are almost infinitely protracted. Um, but they still have their spirits and they still have their bodies. Whereas, again, the Oathbreakers, dead bodies have long since uh, have long since decayed. Um, now, uh, uh, what was his name? Somebody asked a really good follow-up question. Uh, Beonric asked a really great question. I'll come back to that in a second. Let me hand in our quest here. Okay, excellent. You are, there you go. Enjoy your slug meat, man. I really hope that you have a good time with that. Is Ed Dow, Ed How, is he chatting up this lady over here? Kind of looks like he is. She looks like she's not into you, man. Okay, there's your mud balls. A true gatherer. Okay. All right. Um, stay a while so we can learn more about the world beyond the dug. Oh, yeah, that's right. You're the guy who likes strangers. Um, hey, I'm happy to teach you about the world beyond the Dunbug. <laughs> Tell Gwyn he's taken enough swords. Okay. Uh, so his, Gwyn's determination to be killing the biggest monster he can find is very trying to you, is it? Okay. If he wants to be the best hunter, he will survive with his own two hands for once. Okay. Uh, that seems a little harsh, but... Okay, oh, uh-oh. What do you want me to do here, Ben? Even the Bine? Need of help on occasion. I've helped you greatly. Okay. Perhaps I can assist your hunters. Sure. Happy to do it. Uh, what do they do? Oh. No, I'm just supposed to find their camp and help them. Okay, sorry. Vector quest, not actual quest. Got it. All right. Uh, and nobody else? Has, still nobody else has any quests for me? Is it supposed to go back to Gwyn and then find the hunters? Fine. Okay. Great. Um, sorry, let me scroll back here. So, Beonric, right. Why was asking why does a Sildor have the right have the might to let a whole army stay in the Wraith world? Great, great question. Um uh, it's an important thing to remember. There are two factors at work when you're thinking about Oathbreakers. Right? Um on the one hand Oaths themselves have power. If you swear an oath, it means something, um, and it has the power that, uh, that you will be bound to the oath that you swore. Um, and the, the oath itself has like this power to pursue you. So when you pledge yourself to something you are binding yourself to that thing. Um, so the failure of the Oathbreakers to fulfill... The, so in part, they're remaining, they're being constrained, to, their spirits being constrained to the mortal world after they die is in part of their own doing, right? Because of the oath that they swore. But that's only part of it. It is also in fulfillment, in direct fulfillment, of the curse that Isildur levels at them, right? He curses them for... Um, not fulfilling their oath, and he dooms them to have their spirits continue to wander, uh, to wander the world. So, to some extent, there is a, uh, um, uh, there is a, a power and authority to his own word as well, which seems to have a hold on them. Right. Um, we'll come back to that in a second. Here you go, Gwen. Uh, you're not getting a sword. Oh, excellent. Thanks for breathing life in Underwath. Oh, so I should, uh, I should, uh, you know, wrestle 
alligators with my bare hands. You just made my day. All right. Okay, where's those? Where are those hunters? There's the bonk beetle. Ooh, is that a slug matron? I think it is. Wow, that's a big slug. Okay. I'm looking for the hunters. There we go. Okay. All right. Uh, okay, Harry. You are welcome here, as long as you do not trouble us. The beasts of the Dunbog are stronger, faster, and st probably stranger than anything I've seen before. We hunt with our bare hands if necessary. Okay. All right. All right, challenge accepted. Oh, a patched hat, huh? What is it? Wow. That is truly something. Wow. You know, if it weren't for those, like, horns in the front, from the rear, this is kind of a, a cool-looking hat. I can't get over the things in the front, though. Oh. Oh, those are cool gauntlets. I like those. Look at that. Yeah. Oh, no, those are great. Yeah, I definitely want those. Do you want to actually equip them? Eh. Maybe. Nah. Not really, but still. Hear me out, Devodiad, for I have a tale to tell. Okay. I gotta kill a bunch of Avunk and harvest their corpses. Got it. I can do that. Uh, but first, hang on. I gotta update my cosmetics here. So, all right, hang on. Let's see. Outfit six. It's my done lending outfit, which I still need to dye and haven't done yet. Yeah, see, these are more gauntlety, and that's not nearly as cool as those ones I just got. Where are they? Okay, yeah. Uh, where are we going? Here we are. All right. Oh, yeah. Oh, that's so much better. That is cool. Yeah, the fingerless glove thing. Totally better. Excellent. Okay. Well, that makes a world of difference. All right, Luark. Do not speak the names of evil things, for you will call them. Uh, turtle shells. Upgrade from beetle shells, you say. Okay. Kill a bunch of Avank, kill a bunch of turtles. Hear me out, Devodiad, for I have a tail. Turtle tail. eggs. <laughs> we love hunting them too much, perhaps. Okay, see, you, th you think you've got a turtle hunting problem? Rodri? Well, if you, you know, the first step is admitting you have a turtle hunting problem. So, you know, I applaud your courage here. Alright. Okay, Mr. Bog Turtle. Hey, can I pick your pockets? What? Oh, come on. Shouldn't turtles have pockets you can pick? Oh, well. Um, okay. And an egg lying randomly. So, back to Isildur. So, Isildur... On the one hand, I think, to some extent, his power, like his curse against the, um, his curse against the Oathbreakers is efficacious in part because it's their own, it, you know, he is, he is part of the oath that they have sworn because the oath was sworn to him. So he is the, he is, he's like the holder of the, of the vow. Um, so to some extent, the 
um, the authority that he has to make that curse come home to them is granted to him by their initial submission, right? I mean, because he's the one they swore the oath to, he can bring their oath-breaking home to them. But... Um, Isildur is also kind of a big deal, and you... Part of being a big deal, you know, is having your words be able to be able to take root. I mean, curses curses are a thing in Tolkien. Curses work. Um, not everybody's curse works all the time. Um, you know, it's uh, and not everybody's curses work to the same extent. It has to do with the authority, with the power of the person who's giving it. So the fact that Isildur is very powerful in himself is a big part of why the curse he makes is is able to uh, to come true. Again, especially then you add it to the fact that it's it's about their oath that they swore, so they're bound to it anyway. But but again, even Isildur just if he were just to, to deliver a curse. Um, you know, sort of because he felt like it. It would, it would have some authority because he's. Wow, that turtle egg just spawned already. Wow. I'm gonna stay here and run back and forth between these two spawning rapidly respawning turtle eggs. Um, uh, remember that, um, for instance, Thorin and Company curse things. We see that happen. Right? They lay curses on the troll's gold that they bury not far from the road. Um, they lay a curse on it so that nobody can ever come back and, and take it other than them. Right? Um, and so Bilbo and Gandalf take it when they come back, presumably because the curse won't bite on them. Um, but curses generally do bite often. Dwarves are kind of famous for them. Um, so we don't know the mechanism of like how that works, right? Why should that work? Um, if somebody else curses you to something, you know, why should that be operative? Why should that affect your destiny? Again, we don't really know other than it's a like significance of words thing. If you one of the way in which you, uh, in which your power, you know, what it means to say he's a powerful person, right? Um, you know, that he has great stature um, is, you know, part of what that means is to say that you have the ability to, to say things and make them happen. And, and so he does. Other, th oh no! There's, an, there's, there's an, another, I, all of a sudden I heard another airplane coming through. Turns out I was too near to those frogs. Um, yeah. Man, that toad was really huge. Okay. All right. Let's see. Did I get enough turtle stuff? No. Still need a few more turtle shells. I'm just, I'm wanting to be careful because I don't want to develop an addiction to turtle hunting. Sounds like it's, you know, a real concern. Um, anyway. Okay. Um. Okay, oh, let's see. Ethelot had a question here. Um, where, where did it go? Oh, there it is. Why didn't Arnor utilize the farmland and pastures of the Shire before the hobbits came? Hmm. 
Why didn't Arnor utilize the farmland and pastures of the Shire before the Hobbits came? Well, my first question is, do we know for sure they didn't? Maybe they did. What evidence do we have that they did not do that? Notice that in the game, you know, the Lotro theorizes that they did, in fact. I mean, you can tell because there are Arnorian ruins in the Shire, like the, the Stock Tower, right? Or whatever it's called. Um, so, they clearly theorize that during the Arnorian, during the, you know, the high point of the Arnorian um, kingdom, they did have constructions, walls and buildings and towers and things in the Shire. Um, And if that's the case, then I don't see any reason to imagine that they were not also farming there. Um, Remember, the arrival of the hobbits in the Shire is very late historically. I mean, uh, it was only, you know, just over 1,500 years ago, right? So well advanced into the Third Age. Um, that the hobbits arrived in the Shire long after uh, the fall of, uh, uh, you know, like after Enuminous was no more. Um, and remember your map. Once, uh, let's look at the map. Okay. The Shire is quite near to Lake Evenden. So when the Arnorians are still have their capital at Enuminous, they're right next door to the Shire. But Fornost is way over here, um, at the top of the Greenway, much further removed from the Shire. And what's more, by the time we get to Fornost and the divided kingdom of Arnor, um, we've got contested land. Right, where is the Shire? Cardolan, Arthedain, right? It's a little further away from Rudour, but um, but it's not really clear. So the the you know, hey, let's occupy this land and uh, you know farm it um, is less obvious, less obvious and less obviously convenient uh, a proposition um, than it would have been back in the days of Enuminous. Um, so again, I see no reason to think that that land was not being utilized, you know, was not being farmed um, while the Dunedain were ruling Arnor from Enuminous, and the game seems to uh, seems to assume that that either that that happened or that that was at least plausible that that would happen. Um, and so I believe that this suggests that the Arnorian ruins that we see in the Shire in the game all date from before the time when the capital of, you know, before the Civil Wars, basically, before the division of the kingdom. Yeah. Now, it is possible... um, Who was saying this? Oh, Phil was saying the Shire might not have been quite so nice and tidy before the Hobbits arrived. Uh, yes, yes, I think it would have been different, um, but it still would have been presumably fairly open, fertile land, um, you know, available to be farmed. Um, but I mean, you're right, the, you know, there's no reason to imagine the Shire, you know, looking exactly like it, uh, like it looks now right earlier on, just without hobbits in it. Um, that seems to me not, uh, not a, you know, not necessarily an obvious way to, to look at this. You know, there's no reason, real reason to think that that's what the Shire was like. Okay. And yeah, JJ, I love that too. JJ is pointing out how you know, the temptation that Sam has when he has the ring about you know, not having a garden swollen to the size of a realm um, and that that essentially 
comes true after the scouring of the Shire when he is using his bo- his box right of uh, Lothlorien dust in order to plant things all over the Shire. Um, there is a kind of fulfillment of that vision, but it's a, but it's a wholesome one, um, and this is something that I think is. Um, a, prin- a, 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 a sort of a generally applicable principle, actually, for many of the ring's temptations. Um, just as, so, okay, Boromir, right? He wants to become, you know, to become a king benevolent and wise, right? Um, to lead armies to victory and, 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 and become a king be- benevolent and wise. Well, he fails to resist that temptation. Um, he's redeemed, but he succumbs to the temptation. Um, Faramir, his brother, does not succumb to it, right? Uh, Faramir resists the temptation. Um, but notice what happens with Faramir, right? He becomes a prince, not a king, right? Um, but uh, a a king benevolent and wise, you know, a, a prince benevolent and wise, um, you know, with the respect of everyone who is leading armies to victory and rallying people to his banner, like it kind of happens uh, for Faramir, right? Um, not in exactly the way that um, that Boromir imagines it, just as, of course, the, you know, Sam having a garden swollen to the size of a realm doesn't literally and exactly happen either. Um but the thing which is like the good and wholesome version of that, or rather, to say it the other way around, the good and wholesome thing of which the ring temptation vision is a perversion, right, a twisting, um, actually comes true for those who resist the temptation. And that seems to me an important principle involved there. Druid's Fire would not say that Faramir's temptation was the same temptation. Um, he's a different person from Boromir. Um, it's just interesting to me that where he ends up in the end is very like, it it reminds me of the thing that Boromir was tempted to. Um, uh, It's not exactly the same same temptation uh, in that his motivations aren't the same. Um, His own glory is one of the things which is Boromir's weak spot, like his desire for his own glory. Faramir doesn't have the same weak spot, so the, the ring is not working on the same thing in him. And so, therefore, the temptation isn't the same. But the circumstances are very similar. And, again, the outcome is, to me, really interesting there. Okay. Uh, oh, right, and JJ is saying Sam also does it with his own hands, right? His own hands to use, not the hands of others to command, right? Exactly, and that's what he does in the Shire, right? Yeah. You now know the power of the turtle shell firsthand. What does that mean? Oh, like, because the shells were deflecting my blows, and so therefore I can see what great shields they would make? Or do you mean I have now tasted the intoxicating, uh, you know, the, the, I, I have, I have, I have sipped of the intoxicating beverage that is, turtle hunting, and now I'm going to be hooked myself? I don't know, man. I still think that I'm glad you're admitting you have a problem. You are welcome here. Okay. You do not trouble us. Oh, yeah, I killed lots of Avonk. No problem. And then you were the turtle egg guy. Right, Rodri? I have not seen your kind. Saving the turtles is very important to the hunters, because fright because you're addicted to hunting them, so yeah, we want to preserve them. Okay. All right. Okay, what next? Do we go back to town now? Ready for the ultimate challenge. Oh, dear. An avunk called Blood Maw. All right. Uh... She must be dealt with. Her lawn roast may one day be overrun. Okay. 
in the ruins, right? Okay, I was just there, but that's great. I can go and... That's it? Nobody has any other quests for me? All right. I will head out to the ruins, then I'll see if I can find Blood Maw. Oops, hang on. Yeah, try it again, Griffin. Hurdle! Yay! Okay. Now, Grifflet, you're off your game here, because you... didn't even look at these ruins. Hmm. Who would be building down here? Oh, wait. What's Gwyn's Banner about? I have a Gwyn's Banner quest. Do I get it if I click on it? Oh, hang on, because i got to kill this Avog first. Alright. i got to find out what's up with that banner. What just happened? Oh, look. I summoned him? Why is... Oh. Okay. I didn't really need the help. I didn't know that would happen. I thought it was a... I thought it would confer a quest on me. Okay. Okay, don't worry. I saw the corpse. Oh, that's right. I forgot anyway. I forgot to do my treasure finding thing. Okay. Well, he's going to be inconvenient as I'm sneaking. All right. Try to sneak, Gwen. Yeah, strong work. I'll leave you to that over there. All right. So we're trying to find Blood Maw, and we're trying to identify these ruins and see if we can find any reason to suspect what these ruins are. I have seen no representations of any kind carved on these walls so far. Uh-huh. Okay. Oh, just another corpse. All right, we're getting warmer. I've still seen absolutely nothing on this. Oh, man. I can't stealth myself because stupid Gwyn is in combat? Oh, that's really annoying. Yeah, I really didn't know that that would summon him. I forgot, th or if I did know, I forgot it. Okay, all right, good. Now I can stealth again. All right, let's see. Let's see. Where is she? Where's Blood Maw? Thought I saw something on the walls there, but I, I guess not. Hmm. Does anybody see any Arnorian markings? I see no stars. Or Gondorian? I see no trees either. Oh, there she is, all right. She's a little hard to miss. Yikes. Wow. Wow. Oh, 
Okay. Yikes. She's absolutely enormous. And I'm still stealthed. Aren't I? Am I? Huh. Oh no, I'm just like inside the belly of Blood Maw. Come on, Griffith, extract yourself from her corpse. Okay, there you go. Whew. Okay. These ruins are kind of disappointing. The only architectural hint that's really strong enough to go on that I can see is this gazebo thing. Okay, hang on. Aha! <laughs> I knew it. It's the gazebo thing. Ta-da! Seven-pointed star set into the floor of the gazebo. Yep. Yep. So. Gosh, what a strange place for a ruin of any kind. I guess along the river would be the point, right? It's not that close to the river. Hmm. All right. Yeah, yeah, no, I'll 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 get the chest. No, Indra, I'll be good. I mean, finding the star set into the stones of the plinth of this uh little gazebo here. It's far more valuable than whatever is in the chest, but I won't forget the chest either. Look at that. Some scraps of weathered and lending text, which I wish I could read. <gasps> Look! Oh, would you please? Artichokes! It's an artichoke gazebo! Oh my goodness! Um, for those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, um, we were looking at this and exploring the Lord of the Rings field trips. This three-petal thing, right, we were first noticing, at least I was first noticing it, in the little gazebo ruin at the top of the hill in the field outside of Esteldeen in the North Downs. So right, you know, the farmlands right there between uh, Melunin and uh, Esteldeen. And you've got that, the hill with the baby Oryx up there, right, that you bring back into the, you know, the one that you capture and bring into the farm in the quest. And uh, there's a gazebo ruin up at the top there. And we're looking at how the gazebo seems to be sunk in the ground. And there's a weird statue up on top. And it's got this, I, and we could not figure, and I still can't figure, what this icon means these three overlapping like dro water drops but then we were thinking leaves probably and then we were kind of joking that it looked like an artichoke so uh, man 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 but I think that that gazebo the artichoke gazebo as we call it in Exploring the Lord of the Rings um, had no star did it have a star? At the start and the because this proves then that the artichoke motif is an Arnorian motif, which I don't even think we had proven necessarily. See, Phil, I don't think it can be a winged crown because it's certainly not a Gondorian thing. Again, it's the same symbol. You can see that symbol. There's another one like it, um, artichoke gazebo. I mean, up in the Brandy Hills near where you meet the giant. Uh, if you go to find the Hobbit's backpack. There's another artichoke gazebo up there. So they're 
way up in the north, like way beyond the reach of Gondor specifically. So I would not expect us. Uh, it can't be a specifically Gondorian uh, symbol. And yeah, see, look, it's got the, that vine work. See these these viney leaves right there, set along up there, just like the other artichoke gazebo. <sighs> Yeah, JJ, I think the floor is buried on the other one, so maybe it did have a star. Yeah, see, Matthias, that's what I was recalling, that it, I was wondering if it was related to the elves in Meluinen. Exactly. We didn't. We were de trying to debate whether it was an elvish ruin or a, or a, or a human ruin. Um, we couldn't tell. But that one was sunk into the ground... And so it's very like, as this one is partially sunk into the ground, you see how high the ground is on this side uh, and how low on this side. So you can see how, uh, you know, the sort of the depth of the like plinth underneath this, uh, underneath this thing. Oops. I'm going to kill him again. Oh, man. Another artichoke gazebo. Is there any evidence of a statue up on top? Oh, yes, there is. Oh, my. Get out of my way. Avon, come on. Come on. Die. Okay. I sound like a goblin. Die. Die. Uh, okay. Get sneaky, Crowfoot. Hey, what happened? Did I, oh, did I double tap the stealth? I think I did. Hang on. Sorry. Okay. Uh-huh. Hey. Oh, nice moon. Hang on. Uh, yes, indeed. Look, you can see its own little plinth on top, just like that statue. Now it's more broken off, so you're not going to be able to see much of it here. But this is, in fact, though the coloring seems a little bit different, architecturally identical to the artichoke gazebo. That is so exciting. I can't even. I can't even. Wow. Wow. Now I sound like say five people rocks. Um, yeah, no, it's the same guy. You can see it's his staff, isn't he? Carrying, holding a staff in his left hand. All right. See, okay. Identical architecture. So we now have three. Oh, sorry, that's not what I meant to do. We now have three points. At least three points, right? Down here, almost off the map, right? Down here near the river is one. And then up in the North Downs is the second. And then over here in the Brandy Hills is a third. So those are that we have three verified artichoke gazebos. Is one an even dim too? I'm unsurprised to... Uh, I'm unsurprised to hear it. So who builds the artichoke gazebos? And what is that artichoke symbol anyway? Whose iconography is that? Who would be in all of those places? Well, okay, we know it's Arnorian because of the star. But there's an Arnorian gazebo way down here? Elendil, Phil says. Yeah, so, like on his way down to the War of the Last Alliance, he stops to make himself a little gazebo fortress in the middle of the swamp, right? I mean, Gilgalad probably told him he was daft to build a gazebo in the swamp. But he built it all the same. I think that's probably what happened. Uh, wow. This is so exciting. Okay. I don't think I can improve on this. I think we... <laughs> I think we... Uh, uh, no, no, I can't jump over there. So I'm going to have to... I'm going to sneak my way out. Find my way back to the hunter's camp. 
I think we've seen all that we now. Boy, that went from a really, really boring ruin to a super exciting ruin in a heartbeat. Hey, Maven, good to see you. Um, wait, where am I? Oh, here I am. Um, yeah, no, I, of course, I'm far from theorizing, Maven, that it's literally an, arch, an artichoke, right? It's probably not. It, it's sort of, I call it that, be, A, because it's, it's funny. The word artichoke is intrinsically amusing, so I, I like saying it. But also because it's sort of just a, a good way to remember it. Um, but I, I don't think it's actually an artichoke. The idea, though, is it looks, they look like leaves and the, the way they're kind of overlapping in that way. But there's three of them. I mean, the, the threeness of it, right, is important. Um, and the shape is peculiar. Like it could be, they could be drops. They could be, it looks more like a lotus, Marielle. Okay, I can believe in lotus, right? Um, uh, but who would have a lotus symbol, though? I mean, whom does that fit? But it's got to be Arnor, right? So it has to be within an Arnorian context, but it seems to be... It's not like that, you know, proliferates throughout Arnorian structures. And here's the reason, Phil, why I, I, I'm not sure I can buy that. I mean, of course, Elendil went this way, right? Presumably, so... Didn't he? Would he have... They surely would have gone through the gap of Rohan. They wouldn't have gone... They wouldn't have... gone over the mountains. Though Isildur was going home that way, right? Like, that's how we got up to the Gladden Fields in the first place? I agree with the idea of a thistle being in the designs of Arnor isn't far-fetched. But, anyway, but hang on. What, what I was getting at... The reason I don't think it can be a Lindo. I would have exp when we see the what is clearly the older architecture in Enuminous, say, right? The old layer of even dim archaeology, you know, or architecture. I I don't see the artichoke symbol anywhere. If it were something that Elendo was putting on, you know, if if Elendo was building a gazebo, <laughs> if Elendo were building a gazebo, and he decided to put an artichoke on it, right, there would have to be artichokes elsewhere on other things. I mean, he's not going to just pull that out of nowhere. Unless, unless it's a symbol associated with the last alliance itself. Nah. Well, who would it be? So that it wouldn't be part of the normal, like, you know, the normative... Because it's all Numenorian. All the iconography in, in, in Enuminous is all Numenorian, right? Not only the star, but the star and the ship and, and all that stuff. Um... Yeah, but why would he make a three? Well, the third is Kyrdin, right? Jorosi is wondering if the three artichoke leaves could represent the three elvish rings of power. Maybe, but see, Elendil's outside that. And it's a Numenorian thing, so... But it could be a collaboration, so could the star stand for Elendil while the... <laughs> whoa. <laughs> And suddenly, a Dunlending guard flies into the screen. Um, could the um, could the star stand for Elendu and the three overlapping petals be the symbol of the elves? So you've got the human and the elvish part of the alliance. The star is for the humans. the th The artichoke is for the elves. So, the <laughs> three cases of the Minbari. No, it is not Minbari, clearly. Um, 
Uh, yeah. Well, Ethelod, you're right. Kierden would clearly be the third if it were just Elendo, Gilgalad, plus whom, right? Um, not Elrond, because Elrond was Gilgalad's junior partner, so he wouldn't have been a third, but Kierden would be a third. Remember, I think we get the three of them depicted in the statues. Because um, remember in... I'm going back to map. Map, map, map. Map, map, map. Okay. In Eregion... Uh, in... Was it in Mirabel? Yeah, I think it was. It wasn't Echad Eregion. Or do not. No, it was it was it was in Mirabel. Um, we were looking at archi- at the statues there, right? And we saw the familiar Gilgalad statue, and we saw a sword guy, right, which looked like um, I- Elendil. And then there was that other dude who was carrying a, a mace. Wasn't it a mace that he had? Uh, or was it a spear? I don't know. But anyway, it wasn't Gilgalad. Um, and so we were thinking maybe that was Kierden, right? So we had the three of them there. Um, and that, geographically, darn it, did it again, is interesting. Because if, well, but I mean, Mirabel was Celebrimbor's home base and stuff. So, um, yeah. Anyway, okay, all right, okay, okay, okay. If we think of the artichoke as just the elves, who would they be? Gilgalad, Kierden, and Elrond? And if we're if we're leaving Elendil out of it, we're imagining Elendil is signified by the star, right? Elendil, not Elendil, Elrond, Gilgalad, Círdan. Maybe. Okay. And yes, I see the requests to roll a high elf and stream the intro. I will totally do that. I don't know when, but that will totally happen. Um, anyway, all right. I better go or else my kids are going to be left standing on the curb and it is freezing outside, so I don't want to do that, especially. Um, let's... Uh, yeah, all right. So I'll stop there. But then this is this. I feel like I'm getting. I feel like we're getting closer. We're closing in on the artichoke thing. I'm not sure if I buy the whole. It's a relic. It's a symbol specific to the last alliance. Because this is still a rather erratic path. Um. For them to have taken. Even dim. North Downs. Lone Lands, because we know they were at Amansul. Dunland. And what about the Brandy Hills, though? Okay. They would have to jog north out of their way to get up to the North Downs. Eh. Anyway. Okay. Sorry. I'm... I'm seriously, actually done. Okay, thank you everybody for joining me. I will be back next week. Uh, the week after that, I'll be traveling, taking my kids skiing, so I won't be here that week, but then I'll be back on the week of January 6th. So uh, I will be here next week, then off for the week after, and then back for January 6th, and then gone again, uh, no, that's the 6th, it's the 5th. Back, back on the 5th, and then gone again on the 12th, and then back again. So that's the uh, that's the plan. Alright? Thanks everybody for joining me, and I'll see you guys again soon. Bye now! Thanks for joining in on my rambles around Standing Stone's brilliant digital adaptation of Tolkien's world. If you enjoy these adventures, please consider supporting this and other entertaining educational programming by donating at signumuniversity.org fund.